So for homework one, we need something about um, sigma algebra. So we will talk about it today. And then you can start to work on homework one. Okay. So last time we uh, talked about the difference between the, the classic and modern probability theory. Right? Uh, both of them has a, a dealing with this omega, which is the set of considering the set of all the possible outcomes. So this is the biggest space uh, in both frameworks. But in classic theory, we, we assign probability mass to every single outcome in this uh, outcome space, omega. So every point, every single outcome in the omega is assigned with a probability mass. And then, uh, of course, we require this uh, probability to be, every probability to be between zero and one. And then when we sum them up, they must sum up to one, right? So that is the classic uh, way of dealing with probabilities. But then we see that a fascinating example that this classic framework cannot deal with the continuous case. Well, this omega space have, has in, uh, uncountable, um, uncountably infinite many uh, possible outcomes. Okay. So in this special case, the classic theory fails to, <clears throat> to work properly. So that's why we introduced this modern uh, probability theory framework where we are dealing with the same uh, omega outcome space, but instead of assigning probabilities to every single uh, outcome, we assign probabilities to every event. And the event is defined as a subset of the uh, outcome space. And of course, because the way we are assigning the probabilities is different from the classic way. So therefore these two probability uh, functions P, they are different. They satisfy different uh, properties. So we will talk about this later. So following this modern framework, we can formally, we can now formally define the modern probability framework. So this is the focus on today's lecture. So let's talk about how to <clears throat> model the random experiments in the modern probability framework. So this is the rigorous definition uh, of a random experiment. A random experiment is described by a by a probability space uh, triplet. So <clears throat> well, this triplet contains three elements. The first is the uh, omega that we talked about before is the set of all the possible outcomes. And the second one, <clears throat> we call it the event space. So it contains all the possible, uh, <clears throat> all the events of interest. And the last one is the probability law. So this probability law determines how we assign probabilities to different events. Okay. So let's talk about uh, these three elements one by one. Um, so the first one is about omega, which is the <clears throat> set of all possible outcomes. So you basically, you look at this random experiment of interest and list out all the possible outcomes. That uh, entire list forms this omega space. Okay. 
And there are some remarks on this point. So this omega <clears throat> must be what we call mutually uh, exclusive. And uh, collectively exhausted. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, mutually exclusive means that uh, considering all the <clears throat> all the out possible outcomes in this omega space, only one of them can occur at, at one time. So when you basically, when you run this random experiment what for once, for one time, you can only observe one outcome from this omega space. And you can never observe two different outcomes at the same time. Okay, so that's the that's the rule. So if you flip a coin, you can only observe either the head or tail. And the other one is collectively exhaustive. This means that uh, when you run a one experiment, one of the outcomes must happen. And this is intuitive because omega is defined as the set of all possible outcomes. So one of them has to be happening, has to happen. Okay, so this is the omega space. <clears throat> So we can consider some examples. And let's consider uh, this. We have a. Uh, Okay, let's consider this more complicated example. So consider the random experiment. Um, which is about repeatedly uh, flipping a coin until we observe the head for the first time. So it's So you flip a coin for many, many times and, and you stop when you observe the head for the first time. So in this experiment, okay, depending on when you observe the first head, the number of coin flips may be uh, may vary. Okay. If you get lucky, you may observe the head in the first uh, coin flip. If you get unlucky, you may observe. Uh, you you may you, you may observe it until you reach the one hundred coin flips. Okay. So so let's think about for this random experiment. Uh, random experiment. What is the omega space? What is the possible set of pos all the possible outcomes? How do we describe it? Yeah. Right, but uh, the okay. So let's see. Uh, the omega space, right? By definition, it should contain all the possible outcomes. But but the question is, um, in this exper in this in every outcome, how many head can we observe, and how many tails can we observe? Right, because this is uh, this experiment is like we repeatedly flip the coin until we observe the first head. So if we observe the tail, then we continue to flip the coin. So let, let's let's consider 
okay so so the so the pattern of this experiment uh, okay so the pattern of this outcome should look like we flip a coin and we may observe okay we may observe if we get lucky we observe a head and then we stop right if we, if we get unlucky we first observe a tail and then we need to continue to flip the coin because we need to we need to flip the coin until we observe the first head. So then in the second trial, we get lucky, we observe this head. But if we get unlucky again, we may need to wait for the third trial to observe this head. Okay. And this pattern just keep going on. So we can, so these are the all the possible outcomes um, that we can have. And we can assign them. And this, okay, first of all, we may uh, we may have we have infinitely many of these outcomes because if we get very, very unlucky, we may maybe for the first a million trials, we we always observe tails, and then after that we we'll get a hand. So this can go on forever. Okay. So we can assign them. Uh, we can map each of these outcomes to an integer. I can call this omega one. Well, hat is observed in the first trial. So it's denoted as one. And this one, I call it omega two. Well, the hat is observed in the second trial. And this one, omega three. And this going on, you can go to infinity. So, right. so this is uh, all the possible, the list of all the possible outcomes. So, and then omega space is simply omega one, omega two. And all these outcomes. So we can see that this is the example uh, in, this is a random experiment where we have what we call countably infinite many uh, possible outcomes. Because although these outcomes are infinite, but we can find a one-to-one -one mapping uh, from each outcome to an integer, to the natural number, right? So from the countability definition <clears throat> that we introduced last time, this is called countably infinite. We can count it. All right, so this is the, uh, this is still a discrete case because every, right, because it's countably infinite. So it is kind of discrete. We can count it using discrete uh, natural numbers. And we, we can also consider uh, a continuous case. And we have seen this before, which is the bus arrival between nine and 10. And this omega space is basically the time interval between nine and 10. Which is a continuous time interval. So, it, so this one is uncountably infinite. Right. So for the for this omega for this set of all possible outcomes, okay. For this set, the most important structure is the countability. Okay. For some experiments, it is finite. Some for some experiments, it is countably infinite, and for some other experiments, it could be uncountably infinite. Okay. So this is about omega. And the second element uh, that we, we need to talk about is this uh, events, events.
So we know uh, before we have defined events as subsets of this omega space, right? Any subset of this omega is called an event in this outcome space. And then um, because the outcome space contains every possible, every single possible outcome. And in order to uh, calculate the probabilities over this outcome space, we need to have some structures on these events. It's just like when we deal with real numbers, uh, the real line, we need to have some structures and orders on the real line so that we can do addition, subtraction, and multiplication and so on. Right? So here we also need to introduce some structures for these events. So that's that's what that's why we introduce this event space. So uh, in the simplest way, we can simply, uh, we may want to set this event space uh, as uh, all the possible events generated from this omega, but then that is too much. So what we want to do here is trying to reduce the complexity of this event space so that uh, the computation rule becomes easier and uh, uh, easier to handle. So this is, defined as the collection of events that form a sigma field okay so if I draw a picture to illustrate this, uh, so this is the omega space, right? The set of all outcomes and every, every subset is called an event. So we, we, we may, uh, so we can find a lot of events uh, in, this, in this omega. And some of them may overlap, some of them may not. Okay, a lot of them. And in order to form this um, set of events, so the F So this uh, set of events is the collection of some events in this omega uh, outcome space. And moreover, the most important structure is that we, we, uh, we need to have some structures on these events. And this structure is described by a so-called sigma field. Okay. So this event must form a sigma field. And I will introduce, so what is called a sigma field? A sigma field is a set of rules on these events so that they, they, are, they, they, can, they are computable in terms of probability laws. So let, let's, talk, uh, let's just talk about these rules, which are very intuitive if you look at them one by one. So what is a sigma field? There are three basic rules. So F is the set of events. F is a sigma field 
if the following conditions hold. Okay. The first condition is that empty event belongs to uh, this sigma field. This is almost like zero is in the real line. Right? Zero means empty. So here we require the empty event as in the sigma field. And the second rule is that if a certain event is in this F set, then this complement, the complementary event also belongs to this set of events. Okay, for example, if you uh, flip a coin and you get a hat, now it's complementary event, which is tail, also belongs to this, uh, it's also a possible event. Okay, so these two are very uh, intuitive. And the last one is also very intuitive. It says that if, we have a sequence of events belongs to F. Okay. So we have sequence of events and each of them is in this F. Then the union of these events also belongs to uh, this event set F. So the intuition is that in order to form this event set F, you need to collect those events that can form such a sigma field. Okay. And these are these sigma field rules. They are the fun, uh, They form the fundamental rules for the probability theory. Right. So, so let's go back to to look to look at the big picture again. We have an omega set, which contains all the outcomes, and then we started we started to look at the events in this set. We may have Many, many of them, okay. but we, uh, but the, but we only care about the events that can form a sigma field. Okay, so what is a sigma field? We collect those events such that this set of events satisfy these three conditions. Right, empty set, empty event is in this is a possible event. And if an event E belongs to this F set, belongs to this event set, uh, then its complement also belongs to this set. And if, if many of these events belongs to this set, then their union event also belongs to this set. So we can, uh, so let's consider some, um, okay, before, before we consider some examples, we can uh, apply these three rules to uh, develop some, some further results on this. Based on the first two points, we can conclude that, if you look at first point, it says that empty, event is in this set. And then the second point says that for any event in this set, its complement is also in this set. Now, because empty event is in this set, so we can conclude that this event, the complement of this event also belongs to F, right? Based on the first one and the second one. You just replace the E in the second one by this empty event. So empty event, based on the first point, empty event is in this set. And then based on second point, its complement must be in this set. 
And we know that the complement to the empty event is actually the entire omega. Omega outcome. Outcome space. Right. So from the first two points, we know that uh, for two forms such as sigma field, this F must contain the entire omega outcome space as a single event. So this is one of the events uh, in this F set. From the second and third point, Now the second point talks about uh, the complementary events. Okay, if E is in this set, then its complement is also in this set. And the third event talk about union events. Okay, if a sequence of events is in this set, then there are unions also in this set. Now, when we when we talk about sets, set theory, we have a union, and we we also have intersection. So a natural question is what happens to the intersection of this of these sets so if we have a sequence of events belongs to f then will the intersection of them also belongs to f But based on point three, we know that their union uh, is in F. So here we will need to leverage a relation between uh, intersection and the union using the De Morgan's law. So this intersection of sets is equal to Uh, the union of the complement of each set and then taking the complement. Okay. We can draw a figure. Let's consider the case where we only have two events, right? So the intersection of these two sets, which is the overlapping part, this part this is the right hand side, uh, left hand side, right? So on the right hand side, we're looking at okay. We first consider the the complement of each set. So the complement of E one. is this green area. Okay. Now the complement of E2, well, get a little bit com complicated. Is this purple area. Okay. Taking the union of this uh, purple and uh, green area, you will see that the union of these two areas is all the areas except for the this uh, intersection part. So in the end, we take the we consider the complement to this union of, of these two areas. That is exactly the intersection part. Right. So that verifies uh, this equality. So this is the case of, uh, of two sets, but you can you can generalize it to to arbitrary number of sets. Questions? Right, the <clears throat> inside is the union of the complement of each set. 
which forms uh, which forms the entire which covers the entire rectangle except for the intersection part. And then in the end, we take a complement to this union union of these sets. So, so that is the intersection part. Yeah. Yeah. Inside this big parenthesis, right? This union of all these complement sets, it forms, uh, covers everything except for this intersection part. And then in the end, there's a complement here. So we need to consider the complement, the set that is complement to this union, uh, union part, which is basically the intersection part. Right? But you can also prove this equality uh, using some arguments, uh, but uh, I, I will not go, go into the details here. Basically on the left-hand side, the intersection of these events means that if you pick any any uh, element in this intersection, it belongs to every single event. And then you are trying, you will try to argue that uh, if you pick anything from the right hand side, it is also it also belongs to every single event. Okay. So now suppose so let's us okay, so let's use this equality to translate the intersection of sets into the complement of a u as of a union of the union of a bunch of sets okay and then let's go back to the uh, to the second and third points okay so there are several things we need to we need to uh, consider before we conclude. So we know that E i is in F. Every event is in F, and based on the first point, we know that the complement is in F. Right, that's based on the first point. So basically, every single every complement of these events is in F. And then inside is a union. So based on the second, based on the third point, we know that the union of this sense, okay, this is in F. Because each complement set is in F. So based on the third point, the union is in F. And then we keep going because in the end, we are taking the complement of this union. So because this set is in F, so based on the second point, its complement must be in F. Right. This set is in F, so adding a complement from the second bullet, we can say that uh, the complement set is also in F. And then in the end, based on this equation, we can say that, okay, the intersection of these sets are also in F. So in the end, if you can see, combine this uh, third point and uh, this point that we just proved, in the end, we can say that if you have a sequence of ev events in this F set, then their union and, and the intersection are also in this F. So it's like the, the, this set F must be closed under union and the intersection. Okay. If you take any union and the intersection operations on the elements in this F set, then 
the resulting set must also be included in F. So these operations are closed. Okay, so let's consider some examples before we get lost. Okay, consider a single flip of a uh, of coin. So we know the outcome space is head and tail. Right, only these are the two possible outcomes. So they form outcome space. And then we can also consider all possible events. The set of all possible events. Because we have two elements, uh, this omega set has two elements and every subset of this omega is, uh, is, a, is called a event. And we know that for a set with two elements, we have in total two to the power of two, which is four subsets. So what are those subsets? It's omega H, uh, it's empty, empty event, H, T, and H and T. So these are the four possible, possible events. That's the power set. Yeah, we, we define it as power set in probably in the previous lecture. <clears throat> and we can try to uh, collect some events from this, from this set to form a sigma field. Now the first one, the first sigma field that we can construct simply is phi and and this omega. This is omega. So this forms a sigma field, which contains two events. One is the empty event, one is the entire outcome space. So why, why this forms a sigma field? We can check the three, uh, three rules. So the first rule is that empty event belongs to F and we have, we have the empty event here. It's right here, right? Okay, so the first rule is checked. And second rule is that if for any event in this F, this complement is in this F. So if you go back here, the complement of, of empty is exactly omega. So omega is also in F. And the complement of omega, which is empty set, empty event is also in F. So these two, these two elements also satisfy the second second bullet. Now for the last rule, uh, if a sequence of sets are in this event set, then their union is also in this event set. Okay. Now if you look at here, we only have two elements. If both of them are in uh, in this F set, then the union of these two creates an empty event union with the omega event, right? So empty union with omega because this is empty event. So their union also gives omega. And we know that omega, we can see omega is in this F1. Okay. So this forms, uh, these two sim simple elements forms a, a proper sigma field. <clears throat> However, it is useless because it only contains two trivial events.
right? One, one is an empty event, um, which is trivial. The other is the entire outcome space, which is also kind of trivial. So let's can so instead we can consider a non-trivial um, yeah question. Yeah, according to definition. Oh, so the question is why do why can we label this head and tail as a single event? Right. So the so according to the definition of the event, right? So an event is um, any subset of omega is called an event. Now, if you go back here, this H is a subset of this omega, right? This H is contained in this omega, and T is also a subset of omega. So that's why we can call these two as events. The last one, right, H and so this event, this set contains both of these two elements, which is also a subset of omega, right? But it just covers everything in omega, but we, it is also called a subset, right? So all these four elements, they are subsets of omega. So that's why we call all these events. And then we are collecting these events in another set. It's a set of events. Right. <clears throat> okay, so we can consider another. Non trivial um, sigma field. So, from, from the first example, we know that uh, these two has to be in the sigma field because, based on the first point, empty set must be an element in this F. So, we must have empty set here. And then, based on the second point, uh, the the complement of empty set must also be in this sigma field. So the complement of empty set is omega. Therefore, omega must also be uh, must be included in this sigma field. Now, so here's my question: Can we can we collect some other events so that this also so that we can form a different sigma field? So, right, so here we have, we, in total, we have four events. And we already have two here, right? These two already forms a sigma field in, the, in, the, in this example, in this F1. But what, what about the other two elements, uh, the, the other two events? Can we, can we include some of them in this, uh, in this F? so that it, it also forms a sigma field. Which one, which one to include? We have two choices here. We can, try to, we can try to include one of them and see what's going on. So if, if we put H, H here, okay, now consider these three elements, three events can, can they form a proper sigma field? Yeah. Uh, so what is the reason? Yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> if we consider, so to check this, we just need to check all the three bullets that defines the sigma field, right? So in, partic in particular, for the second one, it says that if any event is in this F set, then its complement event is, must also be in this set. Now consider this event, this H is now in this set. So by definition, in order to form a proper sigma field, its complement, which is T, must also be in this set. However, we do not have T here. So this is not 
not a sigma, not a sigma field. And you can see that okay, there, there might be a way to fix this, to fix this bug, because we we realize that T must also be in this sigma field. So let's so so that motivates us to add T in this in this cell. And then and now let's see if, if the if this is a sigma field. So to check the compl complementary rule, the complement of H is in F now, and the complement of T, which is H, is also in F. So that's the second bullet point. And for the last point, we need to have, the last point says that take any events, uh, that's it, yeah. Take any events in this set, then their union must, of, must be also in this set. Well, you can try, you can try to take any event. For example, these two, their union is omega, it's in this set. And omega, uh, and these two, their union is also omega because omega covers H. Right? And you, if you union empty with H, that basically gives you H, which is also in this set. If you union H and T, the union of these two becomes omega. It's also in this set, right? So you can check all the com uh, combinations and you can verify that this set uh, is closed on the union. So this is a sigma field. But <clears throat> And from this sing simple example, it's a single coin flip. Okay, from this simple example, we can we can observe that uh, for for a random experiment, we may have multiple different sigma fields. Okay, we can have these two are different, but both of them form a proper sigma field. We have comment over Zoom. Okay. So the question is, is the power set always a valid sigma field? It would seem so. So in this example, um, this is the power set, which is a sigma field. And in general, uh, because the power set contains everything, okay, so the power set contains, so this is the power set. It contains all possible events. Right. It contains all possible events. So if you go back to the definition of a sigma field, the empty event must be included, must be included in the all the possible events. So the first point is always true. And here, if an event E, if we consider event E, because E is a subset in the omega, so its complement is also um a subset in omega. So basically the second point is also checked. And the last one, if we have if we have a bunch of sub uh, bunch of events, each event is a subset of, of omega, right? So their union must be also a subset of omega, which is also an event. So I think the conclusion is that yes, the power set is always is always it is it is always the a, a proper sigma field. And you can say that it is the biggest sigma field that you can have because it contains every possible events. But in practice, we always consider the smallest sigma field of interest because if you have a, if you consider power set as a sigma field, sometimes it's simply too complex. It, it contains all the possible events and there's too much events uh, to consider there. So we will see some examples later. Okay, so this is a, uh, and from this uh, coin flip example, we can, we can already conclude that for a random experiment, there might be multiple sigma fields.
and we can consider a second example. Um, <clears throat> Consider a single single row of die. And we know that omega space, which is the set of all the outcomes, contains one, two, three, up to six. Okay, so this is the omega uh, omega space. And the, the set of all possible events would contain uh, two to the power of six elements. So that's a lot, which is uh, 64, 64 events. So this is a very huge, uh, huge set. So I will not list every single event uh, here. But it's basically, we have 64 subsets of Omega and every, every subset is uh, regarded as event. And then we can find so many different Sigma fields uh, from this example. For example, uh, F, the, the simplest one again is empty and omega. These two always form a proper sigma field. So this is, you can say this is the smallest one. And the, the other one is the biggest one. Which is the power set. The set of all events, right? The power set forms a sigma field. This is the biggest one, right? But both of them are uh, trivial. And we, we can have uh, many other different types of uh, sigma fields. For example, uh, these two must be included in the sigma field. And can we try to um, construct some other sigma fields? So by uh, in order to construct sigma fields, right, you need to add some elements in, into this set. And each element must be an event. And the event is a subset of omega. So you, you just need to pick some subsets of omega and add them to this F set and then verify if that satisfies the definition of sigma field. For example, we can try, I can try to add this event to this set. Right. One, one, three, five, it is a subset of Omega. So this is an event. Now I add this event to, the, to this uh, set. And the next step is to, to verify, to check if this is a proper Sigma field. And apparently it is not because I can tell that the complement of this event, which may contain you know, two, four, six, and those elements are not in this set. So in order to fix this issue, I need to, I also need to add the complement of this set into this entire set. Okay. And then this fixed the, the first bug. So we can, we can now check this, the complement of this one is in the set. And also the complement of this one is also in this F set. So it, it satisfies the co complement uh, requirement, the second bullet point right here, satisfy this one. So the, we also need to check the last one. 
take any uh, events in this set, then their union is also in this set. Well, you can check that the union of these two is exactly omega is in this set, right? And you can check that all the other uh, possible unions, they are, they are always closed. For example, empty set union with any of these two, any of these three events, they are always in this set. And the omega taking union with any other events, it's always omega, always in this set. Right? So in the end, you can also, you can, you can check that these four elements, uh, they form a proper sigma field. Yeah. You mean the event that contains one single? Yeah. Yeah, we can try. We can try that. Um, so th this is the. So we can try to add one element. Um, in this set, for example, I, I add this one. But apparently, uh, it is not a sigma field yet. So we need to consider, uh, for example, the complement of this event must be in this set, but apparently it is not. So we need to add the complement of one, which is two, three, four, five, six, right, in this set. Okay, now this, okay, now we can check the, the rules. Empty is in this set, so the first bullet is checked. And then uh, for the complementary, the complement, this one is in the set, the complement, this one is also in the set. So the second point is checked. The last one, take union of any sets, I think you can, uh, it also satisfies the last one. If, for example, if you take union of these two, it's one, it's here. Take union of these two, it's omega, it's right here. Take union of these two, it's omega. So it is closed on the union. So this also forms a stigma field. And you can you can uh, consider other examples. For example, if you add one, two, okay, two and four. If I add these two elements uh, in this set, and I'm trying to extend it to a proper sigma field. Okay. So let's see, what are, the, what are the other events that we need to add to this set? Apparently, uh, to satisfy the complement requirement, the complement of these two must be in the set. So for this one, we need to add two, four, five, six, for this one, we need to add one, three, five, six, right? And, and now it seems that um, <clears throat> we, we can satisfy the complement requirement, but, but we still need to check the last one, okay? Take union of arbitrary, num uh, arbitrary number of events in this set. It must be also in this set. Well, this is a bit challenging. So we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, and there are many different possibilities. But at least we can see that, for example, union of these two, they are not in this set. It's one, two, four, right? So I need to add them. And then when you add this one, you need to go back to check all the three, three bullet points again, in particular, the complement of this set must be also in the in this set. So you, you have to go back and okay, 
I'm going to consider the complement of this one, which is three, five, six, right? It is not in the set. Okay, so I, I have to add this one. And you can also take, well, um, the union of these two, it gives one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, it is, it is in the set. So this is, this is okay. But are we missing other uh, possible unions? I think that's it. Uh, okay, for example, I, if I union these two, it's one, three, five, six is here. So that is okay. And if I union these two, it's two, three, four, five, six is here. So that, that is also, that is also fine. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. What about? So it seems to be a sigma field. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and you can see that the more elements you add to this uh, set, the bigger the sigma field would be. And you have to always check the three, uh, three rules of sigma field again and again. Okay, and these are uh, all these two examples, right? Single row of a die and a single flip of coin. These are kind of uh, finite examples because their omega space is finite, right? It's always the, so this is the easy case. So let's consider a, a continuous case. Consider a bus arrival between uh, zero and one, one o'clock. So the omega space, uh, all the possible outcomes, right? The, the bus arrival time could be any time between zero and one as all the possible outcomes. And for this example, the sigma field is uh, very tricky. Um, and it's actually beyond the scope of, scope of this course. <clears throat> but I will, I will just describe it as follows. So again, it contains empty and omega, at least these two elements. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> the, uh, so, so the challenge of this continuous case is that uh, the omega is a continuous interval. And if you take um, several fundamental courses in mathematics, you will learn that the real line of the interval, a continuous interval is very complicated. It has very complicated structures because it contains rational numbers and the irrational numbers. And there are lots of structures, details there. So in, in the end, in order to form a sigma field, that's actually one of the uh, most important contributions of Como Groff when he first develops the modern probability theory. That is how to, how to understand the structures of this real line and how to uh, define a proper so-called measure on this real line. So in the end, people come up with this uh, this sigma field for real line. So it's all the possible
Okay, so what does these two sets mean? It means it's all the all the possible subsets uh, <clears throat> of uh, of this interval that can be written in terms of a countably countably infinite union of intervals or a countably infinite intersections of intervals. So basically you, you pick all the all the subsets of omega that can be rewritten in into these two forms. Okay. Of course, if you if the subset that you pick is an interval, then it is it is in this F because if you pick any interval, right? You can always uh, write it as the union of the interval and the empty set. So it's, it is always satisfied these two requirements. But the in the end, the, the key message is that in, in this in this interval, in this continuous interval, you can find a lots of weird sets. Um, but in, in mathematics, we can find a lot of weird sets that cannot be measured. For example, when we consider subsets of this uh, interval zero and one, we all, the the intuition is that we can always pick intervals, or any small intervals within this uh, zero and one range. And for those intervals, we know their lengths, right? If you pick an interval, we know the length of that interval is y i minus x y. That is our intuition. But there are lots of other weird sets uh, on the real line that can. Uh, whose lengths cannot be measured. Right? So to avoid those, those wheels, those extreme cases, we have to consider uh, this kind of structure. Yeah. But there are lots of details uh, from the mathematics perspective that we will not, we will not be able to cover. Um, but in the end, this is the structure of uh, sigma field that, that we consider for, for the continuous case. And you can see that at, at least this two uh, this F set must con contains all the sub intervals uh, with within omega. Okay. Any questions? So this is everything about the. The second element of the probability theory is F, right? So for now, we have talked about omega, we have talked about F. And lastly, once we, once we uh, have these two well-defined, we can start to define a probability law on this F, okay? So let's review the big picture here. For a random experiment, we can have the, we can consider all the possible outcomes that forms omega. And then this F is a collection of events that forms a sigma field. And then in the end, we can uh, define a probability law on this sigma field. So once these two are well-defined, we can define this P. So we call this the probability measure or the probability law, P. And P is a mapping or is a function that takes any uh, event in the, in the sigma field F and then assign a real number to this event. In fact, uh, to be more specific, I can just write zero and one, between zero and one. So it, it assigns every event in this sigma field 
a probability mass between zero and one. And it must satisfy the following conditions. For any event in the sigma field, uh, the probability mass must be between zero and one. Uh, this is uh, intuitive. Probability must be between zero and one. Right? And second one is uh, P omega is one, which is also intuitive because omega is the, <clears throat> so first of all, omega is, must be in this sigma field as a necessary element. And because omega is the covers all the possible outcomes. So this, it is like the biggest event. Right? So the probability of this, this basically means that the probability that all the possible outcomes um, may occur is one, right? Because at least one of the outcomes will occur in this event experiment. So the probability of omega is always one. You can always observe one of the outcomes from omega. So this is also a very, uh, very intuitive requirement. And the last one is really the, the key point. So if E1, E2, are mutually ex exclusive okay. you pick any any number of ex mutually exclusive events in the sigma field what is mutually exclusive means that they all of them have no overlapping with each other now if you pick any mutually exclusive events. Okay. Suppose this is F. Okay. Something wrong with my pen. It's not working now. Okay. Anyway, if you pick any mutually exclusive events, then uh, we must have uh, this is Okay, something wrong with my pen, but I will just uh, mm, refer to the lecture notes. Right. Okay, if you pick any number of mutually exclusive or disjoint events, basically they have, <clears throat> for these sets, right? Every event is a set, a subset. These subsets, if they are mutually ex exclusive, they are disjoint, they have no overlapping with each other. Then the following is satisfied. The, uh, the probability of the union event equals to the sum of the probability of each event. Right. Which is also kind of intuitive because we know that these events are mutually exclusive. So they do not have overlapping outcomes with each other. So if we consider the union of these events, if we consider the probability of the union of these events, it is like measuring the probability of each event individually and then sum, sum them up. But of course, when you apply this rule, you have to make sure, you have to justify that the events that you consider are mutually, mutually exclusive. 
In fact, from the second point and the third point, we can we can already uh, we can conclude that p the probability of empty event is zero, okay? because we know empty event union uh, uh, because we know empty event and the omega they are mutually exclusive. But because empty empty event contains nothing, so these two are mutually exclusive. Therefore, we can apply this this rule to conclude that the probability of this union event equals to the sum of the probability of these two events. And then p omega by the second point, we know uh, p omega must be one. And on the left hand side. Uh, empty set union empty event union omega is also omega so this so this is also p omega which is also one and then you can conclude that <coughs> the probability of the empty event is zero okay. so that's why we, we don't uh, include the probability of empty event in the second bullet because it can be derived from this these two conditions so these three conditions are the minimum requirements <clears throat> to define a proper probability measure or, or probability law. Right. So any function that satisfies these three conditions is called a <clears throat> probability measure defined over this sigma field. And moreover, uh, we say for an event A, if probability of A equals to zero, we say that this event A is a, is a null event <coughs> because it, it happens with probability zero, right? Now, on the other hand, if the probability of any of a certain event A equals to one, then we call it a almost sure event, right? almost sure event. And we have two minutes left. I just want to quickly uh, discuss on this point. Here, if PA equals to one, technically it means that the event A happens with probability one, right? But here we also, we call it almost sure event. My question is, why do we have an almost here? Why not call it a sure event? Would that mean if probability A equals to one, uh, would that mean that uh, some other outcomes may occur? Yeah. Um, I think it is, um, so the question, okay, so let me put it in this way. Um, okay, so the question is, if we have an event A that happens with probability one, is it possible that there are, uh, uh, some other outcomes, some some other outcomes that that do not belong to A may still occur in this random experiment. Right. So if you have an event happens with probability one, can it is is it possible to have some other outcomes that that do not belong to A, but can still occur in this random experiment? Can you think of a example that uh, so we are out of time but I can give you an example if you consider pick a random number between zero and one and uh, you define a as uh, the the uh, okay, you define a as the all the outcomes that uh, the event that the number you pick does not, is not one half, okay? 
you pick a number between zero and one and consider the event, the number you pick is not one half. Any other number is okay. Then because one half is a single point on, on this interval, right? The, pro the probability you pick is zero, is zero. So the probability of this event is exactly one. But on the other hand, one half is still a valid outcome in the in outcome space. So you can still, it is all still possible that you pick one half, right? It's, it is not illegal. Yeah, so therefore that's why we call it almost sure because you can always have these uh, uh, counter examples. Yeah, we will go back to this point with more examples in the next lecture. Yeah, but the key message is that probability equals to one with probability one does not, does not mean always happening. So you need, to, you need to understand this in a rigorous way, yeah. So it's only like continuous Right, so it, it, it always happens in the continuous case. So that's why we, we put it almost before the sure. It's almost sure, yeah. And, and on, on the other hand, if an event happens with probability zero, that does not mean A may never happen, right? If you think about, you pick a point between zero and one, and you may pick one half, but the, the probability that you pick one half is zero, but you can still, it is still possible to pick one half. Okay, so let's stop here and uh, I'll take office hours uh, in the afternoon. Okay, I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>